from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show in Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me Joshua joining me from Ohio. Joshua, the way I love to do it is, you know, and some people love it, some people they don't, but I believe no one can introduce someone else better than themselves. So this is why I would ask you to introduce yourself and what you do. Yes, thanks for having me on, Mehmet. I am Joshua Lysik. I have ghostwritten more than 80 books in the last 12 years for executives, founders, entrepreneurs. That's my primary business. And what I always like to say is that my clients aren't the authors. It's actually the readers. The readers are the customers, people who buy the book. So understanding consumer psychology, what works for influence and persuasion to drive readers to not just want to buy a book, but to apply the book to such an extent that the book actually works for them, creates word of mouth marketing. The word gets back to the author that this book actually works. They sell more copies. The author's friends get a little envious. And then they say, who do you use to write your book? A uh, Joshua. That's how I've grown my business over the last 12 years. And I found a nice niche in the technology space with startups, uh, early stage, and even a little bit uh, later stage company. Uh, so I thought it might be a good fit for you and I to have a conversation um, about writing, publishing, pr written persuasion, that sort of thing for the tech space. Yeah, great. And thank you for, uh, again, being on the show t today, uh, Joshua. Actually, you know what? I think one of the underrated uh, things that we talk about generally in tech is writing, actually, because, you know, like tech people, you know, they, they, usually they do things fast, you know, they are always in rush. So from your experience, Joshua, like why, you know, First of all, like, um, you know, they, they need to have the concept of doing writing properly. So let's start fr from there before going, you know, to, to the other techniques and, you know, the persuasive state part of it. So why it's very important. Yes, writing, particularly persuasive writing, and I use that adjective for a reason, mm -hmm. because we want to make sure that when we're communicating, not only are we communicating our ideas effectively, we're communicating them in such a way that when people hear them, they say, oh, that makes sense. Let's do that. Let's do it that way. If you are a leader, if you're an executive, if you're a CTO, it behooves you to inspire people to take the actions that you want them to take. This is effectively leadership 101. Mm -hmm. But particularly the tech space, in my experience, there is a predominant concept of coercion or coercive writing or manipulation. I'm going to get people to do something I want them to do, be it the board or be it uh, employees, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what can we do to kind of will them into taking the action that we want? Could we use fear? Could we use scarcity? Could we use urgency? Could we use your jobs, your livelihoods are on the line, the fear of missing out. And that, let's say, sort of uh, framework or perspective is the starting point for much communication, be it communication with customers or, or, or shareholders. Uh, sometimes I'm, I'm an investor myself. And so mm -hmm. There have been some unfortunate situations where you could tell the executive was doing some obfuscation where they're trying to say, Things are really bad while using lots of positive language. But what they what they write is uh, is word salad, which I like to call anti-persuasive. So word salad is where someone uses 
many multisyllabic words all together in dense sentences where there's a lot that they're saying that's abstract and that's vague. And reading it, you're thinking, what exactly is this person saying? I, I see each of these words and I know what they mean, but all together, I don't know what the point is. And usually that sort of communication indicates, I really don't want you to know what's going on around here. That sort of, that sort of language. And so those of us who understand persuasion can see what's really going on in the world. So not just being able to write, but also being able to read between the lines, so to speak. Persuasive writing is useful, not just as a communicator, but as the communicate in mm -hmm. that regard. So it's just wanted to understand, you know, if I understood it right from you. So I need to think as a CTO or founder or whatever position I am in. So because I, I, I believe I do this also, this mistake, I did it a lot as well. So I read something and then I ask myself, okay, let me imagine for a moment that someone sent this to me and let me analyze, you know, what I mean by that. And the reason why I did this is because, and this is why the question will come here. I want to understand from you, Joshua, what are the consequences if you do it the wrong way? What could, uh, you know, what could go wrong? Yes, the anti-persuasive -communi anti communication, particularly in writing, number one, it leaves everything you've said open to interpretation and mm -hmm. usually an unfriendly interpretation, such as, wait a second, what is she saying here? Is she really saying? And then something that dismantles your credibility, your authority in this, in this, this space. So that's, that's the first, the first uh, downside. Another downside is if you have something that is urgent, something that is important, that, that's actually going on, be it in your, your email or your slide deck or the landing page on your website where you're getting, you're trying to get, you know, let's say alpha customers or beta customers and you're unable to get across the message. It's like, oh, that's really cool. Okay, going to go back to the way things were, going to go back to that act my routine, back to life here. And there's no drive to, oh, I should do this right now. We should take action right now. Like, oh, that's, that's nice. That's interesting. Okay. And that's the impression people are left with. And when they feed back to you, they will lie. They will say, oh, I would totally buy that. Oh, I would mm -hmm. totally buy that. You see my body language, those watching. Yeah. Oh, I absolutely like this product. <laughs> <laughs> that's the feedback that you would get, but it would be in print in many cases. Right. Oh, wow, they're super enthusiastic about this when they say what they said. Now, this gives us the, the third uh, reason we want to not be anti-persuasive in our communication. And that is when we use adverbs, density of adverbs, like I gave there, totally, very, completely, you know, some are L-Y and in the suffix L-Y, not all of them, mm -hmm. like very, for example. But yeah. When we are using adverbs ourselves or we're hearing them back, we're receiving them in communication back from someone, what that indicates is deceit. Why does it indicate mm -hmm. deceit? Adverbs are modifiers of verbs, adjectives, other adverbs. So when someone says, for example, oh, we are totally putting you next in line. If they had yeah. said, you are next in line. That is a statement of reality, a fact. We don't have to, like if, it, if it's a fact, you don't have to dress it up or anything with an adverb. But if we say you're totally, like literally, it's very certain. Mm. I'm really having to modify this. I'm having to make you really feel, there it is again, another one, that what I want you to believe is true. I'm trying hard here when I'm using adverbs. That is a tell for the informed and engaged communicator that there is deceit. You'll notice this in media, in news. 
how often journalists, pundits, and commentators, and even everyday news reporters will insert adverbs into headlines and into stories where they don't belong. And usually it's a tell that the opposite of what they have said is true. For example, mm. if they mention that they will say uh, a, a certain world leader literally said and then a claim, that often indicates the world leader did not literally say any such thing. If you look mm. at the transcript of what the world leader said and then what the journalist says they said, it's not even close to to do that. So adverbs are both a uh, a tell for being deceived by someone else, but also self deceit. If you are finding yourself inserting, it is very important that you do this. Okay, it's either important or it's not. If it if it if it was actually important, you would give us the reason. You listening to this, uh, watching this right now, if it was important, you would give us the reason. Now, I want to go from what's wrong with being anti-persuasive, like we have been, if that's okay, I'm at two. Right. A subtle and useful, quick and easy reference point for being persuasive. Because I can talk about the use of persuasion, persuasive writing, particularly as a leader, an executive, a founder, an entrepreneur, and the cost of getting it wrong. Of course, the cost of getting it wrong is goodbye career, goodbye job, and, and one of the worst economies we've seen in 15 years. <laughs> So we know the cost, we know the cost, right? But the upside is astounding and you can get there communicating your ideas effectively, moving people to take the action you want them to take, no obfuscation, people understanding you the first time, be it in print or in your speech, with this one simple question. What's in it for me? If you ask yourself that, whenever you are giving a command, whenever you are asking something, asking for something, be it the sale, the job, the capital. What's in it for me? Now, not literally you, what's in it for me? What's in it for the other person? I like your your thought there, Mehmet, where you're, let's say, writing up a writing up an email or writing up a, something, perhaps a social media post or something to a, to, to a client or something. And you ask yourself how the other person feel about this. I, I like that and it and it aligns well with this what's in it for me concept. Whereas if you say, for example, it's very important that we do it this way, my way, <laughs> why? What's in it for the other person? And that one simple question to ask yourself. Yeah. That leads you in the direction of being more persuasive. Because then you have to answer that question in your communication, be it an email or a white paper or a slideshow. Well, shouldn't it be obvious, wasn't it, for you? You get to keep your job. <laughs> that right. leads into the fear, the coercion, the manipulation, the, the urgency, which cultivates a desire to lie to you, to use adverbs at you. And uh, that's not the sort of relationship that we, that we want if we want to have a maximally successful uh, enterprise here. Or you want to have a, a, a career where the people that are closest to you, you can trust, they can trust you. Any sort of obfuscation of the communication kills off that trust a little bit at a time and then all at once. Yeah. Now, the question I want to ask you, Joshua, so we talked about the consequences, right? So now, how do we fix that? How, how is the best way to make that work? Yes. So if we, if we start to go backwards a bit, one thing we want to do is to eliminate adverbs from our speech as much as, much as, we, as, much as we can. So in line with the what's in it for me concept, if I feel the urge to write or say, it's very important that, or it's so important, or I really need you to, that sort of coercive language, that is a win-lose situation. I have to win, you have to lose, because that's just the way it is. While there are some relationships where there's superiors and subordinates inside of an organization, and it may literally be that way from an organizational hierarchy perspective, that is not how you inspire or motivate or drive. That's how you get people to do something. But there is a popular quote from uh, the AngelList founder, Naval Ravikant, and which he says that it's better to play long-term games with long-term people. In anti-persuasive communication, you're playing a short-term game with short-term people. Meaning, mm. okay, get to do this, do this thing for me once. 
And then you never have trust with that person uh, again. Mutual trust in, the, in that relationship. It's very, it's very short-lived. So this one concept of what's in it for me, not using adverbs, steering away from that, stating the facts as they are, that subtle shift allows you to speak from the other person's perspective. Some might call it empathetic communication, and that's true where you feel what the other person will is, is going to feel, but think what they're going to think, and then speak to that. As a, as a ghostwriter with books, I always tell my authors that the first chapter is there to build rapport, where you align with someone, you get the reader, and they understand that where you're coming from is where they're already at. And then that can be done in white papers and slideshows and emails. And it's really laying the context and so often communication is missing the introduction of or the reminder of a certain context now what do i mean by context and what would that look like in a communication so we'll do that with the book we'll do that with email real quick is that okay yeah shoot yes so often in books an author will feel inspired to just start sharing their ideas open with their story, their life story, or here's my seven point framework for blah, 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 or my 12 part system for blah, blah, blah. Okay, why is there a need for this system? What are uh, previous systems attempted? What are the other frameworks that are out there that I've already tried? Why do those not work? Why is yours better? What are the problems I'm dealing with? How, how do I feel that those are problems, for example? And so what we do is we construct the first chapter of a book like a sales letter a sales letter mm -hmm. that hooks us in with a very important claim or some curiosity that's relevant for us right now and what we have going on. What is the problem we're dealing with? How do we know it's a problem? What have we already tried? How does your, how do you know your solution works? For example, the fundamentals of sales copywriting applied to a book. And so right. the reason I do it this way is because on Amazon and other websites, Readers can read the book for free first. They can read the first chapter or so for free. Right. So we have to treat that free chapter like a sales letter. We can't just start the book. So I like to tell authors, think in terms of chapter zero. That is a proper and useful way to think of persuasive communication for speeches, for white papers, and for emails. Meaning, what's the context here? What's most important in this situation? Why are we doing this? What's in it for you? And lead with that in mind. So if you're going to ask someone to do something for you, start with what are the things that they want to get accomplished? What is the problem that everyone wants to have solved? And that's your first few sentences. That's your first few paragraphs. It's the reminder of what's really important and what's at stake here. And then you can get to your request versus do this now, or I need you to start with what's most important. What's the agreed upon context here? What's going on? R remind that, reinforce that before asking the request. And by the way, you'll notice that excellent slide decks that people have mm -hmm. aired you know, here's the slide share or the, uh, you know, of this famous slide deck that, that resulted in this many hundreds of millions raised, for example. Uh, I, I see people a lot in the tech space. We'll, we'll share those and we'll, we'll try to use those as templates, <laughs> kind of grip it and rip it to, to lay out their own pitch uh, following that format. Of course, a lot of AI companies are having trouble raising money right now. That's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other situation. <laughs> exactly. Um, but what do those slides all do, those slide decks? They always start with the context. What's changed in the industry? What's stopped working? What are the new opportunities out there? Why do we need to act fast? Long before the technology is mentioned, they don't lead with, hey, here's our idea. Want to give us money? No. What's the context of the idea? What are the problems? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? Those sorts of things that, that are uh, agreed upon. What are the risks? What are the threats? Why is this urgent? Like actually, urgent. don't just say, oh, it's urgent that we, that we get our product to market. Who cares unless you've told us why to care? So those, those are some simple tips to think through before you 
you demand or command, what is the context here that is agreed upon? What is the, what is the innate urgency uh, of the situation? Start yeah. Yeah. Actually, if, if maybe I'm sure you noticed that uh, Joshua, and this is exactly, I'm doing the same uh, sequence when I'm asking you the question, because what I wanted to show <laughs> that we didn't deep dive, you know, immediately in persuasive, you know, writing. So need to give the context to the audience. And this is why, you know, sometimes I, I consult with startup founders or to be startup founders and they come up with me, you know, like, yeah, as, exactly as you mentioned. Yeah, we have this idea, you know, and we, it gonna be the next unicorn. I say, guys, okay, you might be up to something, but if you don't, as you mentioned, it's, I love to call it, you will call it like it's a sales, uh, you know, letter. I like to call it like a story, right? So it should be a or customer journey. So you need to tell me what happened, why this happened exactly the way you mentioned. And this is why I didn't want also to dive now today. I say, hey, hi, Joshua, how are you? Tell me about, you know, personal strike. So I could have done this, right? But I wanted yeah. to put the context so people understand. Now, if I want to learn this, right? I want to, and of course, like it's not something that can happen overnight. Like it's something that needs a lot of practice, I'm sure. But like, what are some of the techniques and, you know, tools that we can use to learn to do the proper method? Yes, yes. So I'm going to borrow a little bit from a program that I that I have. So at, sure. at, I have a program called Best Weight Persuasion. And every single month I send the subscribers, the paid subscribers, a new technique, specifically an advanced business persuasion technique that's working this particular month for my clients who are authors and entrepreneurs, often in the tech space. And I spend, you know, I, I go through the, the here's, here's why it works, here's how it works, here's how you can do it to either take a few hours to implement it or a few weeks if you want to go full mastery level implementation. And one of the one of the first case studies that I, that I lay out is the concept of the 97%. So market, market research analysts have, when they examine a total digestible market, find that only 3% of that market is ready to buy. They are credit card in hand. They are check in hand. They are, they are sold. Those are the people who do not necessarily need the context. They're ready. And yet, and yet, so many business owners, entrepreneurs, founders, so on and so forth, marketers, salespeople, speak or write as if they're talking to, they're addressing only that 3%. There's mm -hmm. no context laid first. Whereas the 97%, they're the, obviously the vast majority here. Those are the people who are not buying right now but they have needs that you are capable of meeting, that your product is capable of meeting, that your company is capable of meeting, that your offer is capable of meeting. What we have to do is simply lay out the chain of beliefs, chain of beliefs. This is a concept that we borrow from hypnosis, actually. Quick aside about hypnosis. People think that hypnosis is a sort of stage magic illusionist mysticism, mes mesmerism sort of uh, idea. Whereas really what hypnosis is, is it's subconscious self-persuasion. Subconscious self-persuasion. So in a clinical hypnosis context, the practitioner is there with the patient, patient sitting back and relaxed, and the hypnotist walks the uh, client through a guided visualization that has embedded suggestions in the story that they're telling. And when they're deeply relaxed or in that suggestible state, the person is offered suggestions instead of embedded in this story that the hypnotist is telling inside this visualization about the particular issue or a, an analogy for the issue that the person is, is dealing with. So therefore, the most common reason someone goes to a hypnotist is to quit smoking, quit drinking, sleep better, lose weight. Those are sort of like everyday practical, practical challenges. Practical challenges. The problem with hypnosis is that it works too well too fast to be a viable business model. I will say that again. 
The problem with hypnosis is that it works too well too fast to be a viable business model. Most hypnotists do not earn much money, unfortunately, because they're not therapists. They don't need to drag out the top therapy sessions for weeks, months, and years. Many of their clients will show up for 150 bucks once or twice. The problem is done after the person struggled with it for years. Everyone listening right now understands that what I just said indicates they need to apply hypnosis principles to their business, to their career immediately because it works so well. The chain and beliefs concept is borrowed from hypnosis. And so it allows us to speak to a much broader market or rather a broad, much broader segment of our total addressable market. This sort of 97% that we find who are at various stages of awareness or research or, or, or whatnot. So the 97% are those who are aware that they have a problem, but they're not quite sure what the criteria for the solution are. Is it figure it out themselves? Is it just do what they've always done? Is it to buy something? I don't necessarily know. The chain of beliefs concept starts with what they know to be true and leads them to what you know to be true. What they know to be true is that something is wrong here. What you know to be true is our product, our offer, our company makes it right. Yeah. So what are the steps, the stages in this chain of beliefs concept? A wonderful analogy that's useful here is dominoes. You ever see dominoes where you set them up one after the next and you knock the first one down and then it just naturally goes on to the next? In writing, we call this flow, where the writing flows from one point to the next. There's not any leaps, jumps, or gaps in reasoning. So many slide decks that I see are, here's a problem. We have a startup that's going to solve it. And then let's get right next, next slide where this is a unicorn business model. <laughs> and there's this whole gap of, wait a second, uh, how are you going to go to market? How do you know that that's the right segment? How do you know it's going to work? Have you ever done this before? And, and there's all sorts of questions that are asked that aren't answered. And so it's like, there's a domino here, domino here, and the next domino is way down here. You knock the first two over, and then you just have to, well, the next one's gonna fall over on itself. Like there's, there's a break in the chain of beliefs concept here. There is a wonderful marketer named Eben Hagen who said many years ago that the essence of marketing is changing someone's beliefs instantly and forever. The chain of beliefs concept. By the way, he was a professional hypnotist and, and uh, in marketing in his space. He worked a lot with um, men on confidence issues and whatnot, which helps really well when you are persuasive. But coming back to the chain of beliefs concept, what does this mean for the 97% here? What's, what's going on? This is advanced business persuasion because what you can do is you can think through what does someone need to believe in the order they need to believe it to go from we're aware that there's a need for this to I need these people I need this company. I need this offer. I need this product. What, are, what, is, what is in that chain? By the way, when I'm ghostwriting a book for someone, we often align the chapters to each of those beliefs that people need to have and the order they need to have them in order to reach the conclusion that we want. So, for example, if you are if you're fundraising, what are all the, the beliefs that need to happen? Well, I need to believe that there is a real problem. I need, to, I need to see data so I could justify logically. Oh, okay, there, there really is a problem here. Mm -hmm. How do we know it's a problem? So what are the manifestations? What are the consequences? The data that demonstrates that. Not just a claim, but demonstration of data. Okay, I guess it is. Okay. Well, how do we feel it? So what are the, the anecdotes, the qualitative market research? What are we hearing, feeling, seeing that we know that this is a real urgent issue that is beyond the facts, the data, the boring, the humdrum. People are feeling it, right? And then what are people currently trying? So what are we doing here? Chain of beliefs. So I believe that there's a problem. I believe that there's evidence demonstrating that it's a real problem. I believe that people are feeling it. So what's the next thing I need to believe? Well, the next thing I need to believe is that people aren't getting solutions that are working. So I need to believe that existing solutions are inferior. So I haven't even pitched my product yet. I haven't even said you need, to, you need to do this. You need to jump in, you need to buy, you need to do anything that's right. We're selling the belief. So I also need to believe that there are existing solutions that are inferior. Now, what do I need to believe 
in the chain next? What's the next domino to, to fall over that will knock over the next one, right? That's what flow is, is where you're, you're not skipping any steps. You're not skipping anything that people need to believe to be true. Now, this is rather a tedious process, but you'll notice it's not art or creativity or inspiration or the muse or anything that so many people think that communication is, that persuasion is, where it's a sort of inspired creativity-laced effort. It's not. It is boring, frankly, and it is tedious. That's why people buy it. That's why persuasion. If I could give a little plug for that right there, because I just say, just do this. I do the, the, the hard part of the thinking and the creativity first. And then, okay, you just do this. And, and that we can run the sales and marketing test for your company. You know, this this month, but try another one next month and the one after that, so on and so on and so forth. The chain of belief concept is, is so useful and applicable because what you do is you make sure that there is alignment, there is context, there is rapport. And so that it's natural that people say, oh, well, yes, this is this is the product, this is the offer, this is the company, we're going to do this. But getting each of those beliefs stacked in the right order. So really, it's not trying to coerce someone to believe something. It's thinking through, what do I need to believe to be true? And in what order do I need to believe it to naturally reach the conclusion I'm trying to persuade people to? Because at that point, you're not doing any persuading or sleight of hand manipulation or a popular phrase is reality distortion feel. What you learn as a hypnotist is that it's all self-persuasion. What you're simply doing is you're giving people what they need to believe in the order they need to believe it to reach the conclusion. I don't need to smoke anymore. I'm a non-drinker now. I can sleep well deep every night. And then those beliefs manifest in reality. Often after the after the sessions, we, we hear reported from hypnotist uh, 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 clients. And so it's a self-persuasion as another reframe, a useful reframe of persuasion. It's not something you do to someone. It's something it's something that you give people what they need in order to do to themselves and the order they need to they need to do it in order to reach the conclusion that you like them to. Wow. Like this is a must, really it's a master class, Joshua. Uh, a lot of things... Uh, you know, you mentioned, I'm sure many people will, will benefit from it. So how do you usually do this, Joshua? Like, uh, do you run a program? Like, uh, how, how do you train people on that? Yes, it depends on what the capacity is that they, that they want, want to help. So I mostly ghostwrite books, but it's not just full-length nonfiction books for founders and executives. It's also their, sometimes it's their white papers. It's their slide decks that I even worked on. It's their emails, their, a lot of stuff they have going on, right? Something that, that executives have realized they need to be doing more of, founders have realized they need to be doing more of, it's creating ongoing content on the regular as part of their own, frankly, their own personal branding, thought leadership efforts. Because if you don't have a personal brand, people are going to give you one. If you don't have leading thoughts, people assume you don't have any. That's less than ideal. <laughs> that is less than ideal as a, as a leader. Uh, and so I, I will often assist in, in writing that. Um, uh, but at the same time, executives, founders, and entrepreneurs recognize that it's not just a an individual issue that is the content creation I need to be doing. It's a company-wide issue. That there's mar there's a marketing communication strategy. There's salespeople that they have. There's the entire funnel, top of funnel, bottom to bottom of funnel. And that's not just for customers. That's also for... Yeah. VCs, angel investors, firms, et cetera, where they need capital uh, infusion and stakeholders. There's multiple funnels inside of their inside of their business. And so the one way that I work with founders is, as I said, with the best way persuasion program, where I lay out here's a here's a business persuasion strategy and how to implement it this month. Uh, if I could give a little plug, uh, it's at uh, lice at ghostwriting.com slash subscribe, if I if I may. Uh, for sure. That's, yep. that's, that's the most scalable version of my persuasion, of my business persuasion uh, training is, is that program. And the 97% report that we've kind of borrowed from a little bit here, uh, that's one of the case studies. And everybody gets that as soon as they join uh, because that is fundamental to understanding business persuasion, applied hypnosis is what I call it. 
is the chain of beliefs concept. Wow, that's that's really very useful, Joshua. And you know, question that you know just came to me. So, other than you know, you you gave some some use cases. So you gave we we talked about emails, communication. You talked about the pitch deck. Um, we talked about even communication not between only like the same team members, like communication between founders and investors. Is there are there any other use cases for for you know uh, or benefits that we would get from applying this methodology? Yes, one of the most tangible benefits, frankly, is attraction. What, what do I mean by attraction? You have a good example of this. You are a good example of this. You call your podcast the CTO show. What does that do? It attracts CTOs whom you want to be speaking to. And not just CTO, but technologists and founders and, and the C-suite and whatnot. Imagine if you had called it the Mehmet show. Unless people knew who you were, they would not be attracted to it. Frankly. Frankly. Right. If so, so here's, so here's an example. If someone visits my website and they see it's all about me, 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 my experience, my books, my opinions, my life story, my bio, as so many ghostwriters have on their website, consider what I do, which is I explain how I write books. I have 20 case studies of authors I've worked with in 24 at this point. I focus on what their books have done for them in terms of revenue generated, opportunities created, media unlocked, investors courted. That is attractive versus work with this Ohio ghostwriter who is blah, 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 no one cares. So this simple concept of attraction, just be attractive. We don't have to lie to ourselves. We don't have to puff up and think, well, I'm Mehmet and I'm great, so I should call it the Mehmet Show. <laughs> it is okay to put the customer, the user, the shareholder, the stakeholder as the center of attention. And yet so few do. And I think one of the reasons that people don't is we're misled by popular brands that do brand awareness, be it a personal mm -hmm. personal brand, their, their founder. A good example in terms of podcasting is the Joe Rogan experience is the name of the number one podcast, right? right. Everyone knows who Joe Rogan is. We know we already have context for what this show is going to be like, who he tends to bring on as guests. Like everyone knows this. There's, there's no questions here. It's all answered. It's going to, some are going to be six hour conversations. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, like, like one, one break right there in the middle. So, so we know. But if you call it the Mehmet show, I just have question mark. Right? Un unless we already know who you are, unless we're already followers, unless we're already bought in. We don't, we don't understand what the, what the context is uh, here. This is a shift that I've made over the years. I'm talking about myself as, as a ghostwriter to what I talk about the result of the book is. So instead of instead of the call to action be hire Joshua Lysak, it's writing 99th percentile quality book. 99th percentile people know exactly what I'm talking about. They know what the benefits of the book are going to be. They know the care that's going to be taken. The context is laid. It's, it's all about them versus hire Joshua. He's done blah, 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 blah. No one cares. Right. So assume that, that you are not the Joe Rogan of your industry, let's say, where everyone knows who you are. And yet we, we look at those sorts of like, examples or companies that do brand awareness, advertising or promoting, or they, they rely on the reputation of one of the founders. And that's half the slide deck is all about them, that person. You might be that unicorn superstar who's got all of those experiences, or, or you might not. So if we look at people who already have name recognition, people and brands, and we, and we try to 
do that, it's not going to work so well. So that's why we don't we don't we don't want to be the Joe Rogan experience. We want to be the CTO show. Wow, exactly. This is uh, when I you know when I started to brainstorm what should I name the show, right? So. Of course, it, it should be discussing technology. Of course, I know what, I, what I'm what I going to discuss, right? So I know the topics. But at the same time, I wanted to, you know, blend with business and entrepreneurship. And then when I started to brainstorm what name could attract audience to that, first thing first, of course, because, you know, who calls the, as you mentioned, who calls the show by their name? People who had some authority before actually they started the podcast. So Joe Rogan. Tim Ferriss is another example. The guy was blogging for years, you know, and he wrote, you know, he had the books and so on going on. So, yeah, so people know who's Tim Ferriss. And for me, okay, my friends know me, you know, people who have, I interacted during my life, they know me. But I mean, this is something that can I go for everyone. And who would, who, who the guy called Mehmet is calling the show Mehmet Show, right? So no one knows me. So I wanted to get, a name that has all these, um, I would say, traits that I just mentioned. So technology first, so CTO. CTO is also usually people when they, you say CTO, CTO and co-founder, startup, right? So yes, this is what it is. And then CTO, it's also like entrepreneurship. And CTO, it's also executives. So yeah, so this is what I wanted to do. So yeah, let's call it the CTO show. Of course, I check, is there any CTO show out there? And I was lucky enough that there, is, there are some CTO other thing, but not show, I mean, as I put it. And yeah, so I decided the CTO show looks a good combination. And one more thing I want to add, Joshua, and this is because even you are, if you are a founder listening or watching us today, so this method, it will work also when it comes not only, you know, raising funds and because I work in this domain as well. So even in sales, actually, because when you are a sales guy and you go out, the last thing you want to, to go and do is just, you know, send the customer an email or a LinkedIn message or whatever, or a phone call. Hey, I've, you know, this product that is fantastic. Do you want to try it? Like, it doesn't work like this. So you need to give the context. And again, Joshua, like this, this topic excites me actually. So um, really, I enjoyed this. One question, which is maybe not related to this, but because in your bio, I, I, I saw it. And because you are in the ghostwriting uh, you know, in space for a long time. Is AI doing anything in that space? Is, is it going to change anything for you, Joshua? AI's impact on ghostwriters has already been noticeable. And I think it's a good thing, frankly, especially with the inflationary recession sort of shenanigans we have going on locally, regionally, nationally, and, and globally. So there's, there's a, there's a nice little one, two punch here going on. <laughs> so I, I will, I will say this twice. AI replaces 99% of ghostwriters. AI replaces 99% of ghostwriters. And the reason AI replaces 99% of ghostwriters is because most ghostwriters think like AI, but slower. Hmm. Most ghostwriters are not themselves. So they say creators. They don't have their own books, their own courses. They are transcribers and interpreters where they will interview the client and then they will transcribe what they say either manually or automatically. And then they will try to take what exactly the, the client said, remove the uhs and the uns, make a couple of edits so that it reads grammatically correct, eliminate spelling errors, add a couple of zingers in there, and there you go. There's your ghostwritten book, case study, chapter, email, white paper, social media post, article for your blog, email, whatever. That's the outcome. Mm -hmm. What I just described, AI does so much faster, cheaper, and better. So what's funny about this is I thought about this in my own book, in AI. So I've, I've seen this coming for a little while now. There is an expression a colloquialism, fast, cheap, or good. Pick two. Uh, uh, mm. uh, AI writing is all three. <laughs> AI writing is all three. So 
what I described in that of ghost but they do, they are hosed to use a, a Canadian a, a expression. And, and frankly, I think rightly so. It's much easier for a, an executive to talk through their ideas to their voice recorder on their app or on their you know, app or their phone or their computer, and then take the scrunch of it, throw it into, uh, let's say, chat GPT or another program is called pseudo write, S-U-D-O write, and I write like writing, pseudo write, and say, so a very slightly edit this for me. Now, feel really good, that's funny. I use adverbs. Adverbs and prompts work well. So mm -hmm. you're, just, you're deceiving the AI. <laughs> you're just going to think about why that works. It, you're deceiving it to give you a better output and a, a better result. I'm the only person who talks about that, by the way. Uh, so it's a little, little uh, alpha for prompt engineering for, for everyone listening. is using adverbs to trick the AI into giving you better, better, better output, better quality output. But that right there, where you're taking your ideas, going to transcript, going to something that's workable, that replaces instantly 99% of ghostwriters. Fast, cheap, and good. Well, it's good enough in, in most contexts, in most circumstances. I am okay with absolutely obliterating my industry in this, in this regard, <laughs> frankly. Um, because number one, that's just the way that it is. And number two, we're already seeing the ghostwriting profession need to be less utilized. Because in a economic downturn, people are less concerned about thought leadership and brand awareness. These sort of fuzzy words that you spend a lot of money on. What you need to be focusing on right now is demand generation. Mm -hmm. And a ghostwriter's writing is not really doing that. I have been a harbinger in the go training profession for years now telling other writers if you're there's on a direct connection between generating revenue and you writing you are screwed i've been saying this since at least 2017 2016 and it seems the, the bill is finally coming due and so most ghostwriters you talk to now are out of work and mm -hmm. that's un unfortunately but it's it's just the way of things in in the ghostwriting um this is with the, 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 the nice little um, uh, double way at me. I have my own books. I have my own courses. I have my own programs. And I also work only with a particular type of client. That particular type of client is not going to be spending hours and hours and hours prompting chat GPT with transcripts of theirs. They want someone who can do the writing for themselves. A, a good example of this is Dr. Philip Ovedia, one of my clients. Now, he's not a, he's not a, he's not a, um, uh, a technologist. He's in the health and wellness space. They do use a lot of technology in their platforms, but he is a founder of, of a company. He is not going mm -hmm. to spend hours and hours in front of the computer with, with transcripts. He is going to get on a call with me for 10 minutes between flights, share a couple quick ideas that he has, and then I'm not going to then go Trump from Jeff, Jeff GPT. I'm going to write something from scratch, do third-party research, compile it together, and weave in his two ideas and turn 500 words into 10,000 words. And it's not going to be abstract. It's going to be concrete. It's going to be visual. And it's going to have all of the persuasion principles and applied hypnosis laced into it. So there is still a place for actual creators who are writing stuff from scratch, not the sort of copy and paste and improve uh, process uh, that, that, that ghost writing, uh, that AI does replace ghostwriting but frankly in 90 of the use cases of a ghostwriter uh ai writing is superior because it's fast it's it's fast it's cheap and it's good like i said in many cases good enough i i, I still i have not seen a book non-fiction book replaced by ai i think completely there's still plenty of space for editors even if they're they're using an ai so that's mm -hmm. fine but by the way the a fiction ai writing is amazing it's amazing. Mm. And that's the last thing that most people think could possibly be replaced by AI is, is fiction. Nope, that's uh, that's actually her. And there are, there are authors, traditionally published authors, novelists. I know I'm kind of going off at this point uh, of my little soapbox here. But there are fiction writers and novelists who are running trainings on how they're using AI to write their books now. Instead of using the fiction ghostwriters and fiction editors. And how you can too. It's, it's nuts out here how much has changed uh, in the last 10 months. Yeah, I've seen a lot of 
I've seen a lot of these, by the way, recently, like uh, they come, they pop up in front of me here and there, you know, people who, who, you know, I would show you how to write a book using chat GPT and so on. So, and fiction, by the way, you're right. I'm seeing like more fiction. They start, I think with uh, a kid's story. I mean, uh, you know, uh, nursery rhymes, these kind of things, you know, like, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're developing very fast. So. Uh, Joshua, again, I know that you mentioned the website, but I want you to mention it again, and it will be in the show notes. So where people can find more about you. Yes, yes. My my best content by far are the monthly business persuasion case studies for, for founders and technologists. That's at lysecghostwriting.com slash subscribe for the monthly case studies. Is it okay if I leave one last tip with uh, True. everyone? Please. And it was one that was prompted uh, by you, uh, in fact, by talking about like write chat, G write a book with chat GPT. I've seen those all over my feed and in social media, people running these forty-seven dollar trainings for a live workshop. You know that that replaces a forty-seven thousand U.S. dollar ghostwriter, or a, I know there there are some ghostwriters who are celebrities that have done hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars plus for for a book. I I being one of them. Why am I not concerned about my business completely, completely evaporating overnight? despite this. And this is a persuasion principle, by the way. Pattern interrupt. We've all heard of pattern interrupt. One thing is not like the other. Apple, orange, Ferrari, banana. <laughs> One of these things is not like the other. That is a child's version of pattern interrupt right there. Pattern interrupt in the persuasion context is saying and doing exactly not what someone would expect. I do that for my clients, number one, because it shows that AI didn't write it or edit it. Number two, because it gets, gets attention. So one quick example of this is, is my book called So Good They Call You a Fake, which is a riff on So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport, which most of your listeners will have read, I'm sure. So Good They Call You a Fake. What? I don't want to call it a fake. Wait, it's a book title. Like, it's a good thing. I'm so good. I should be called a fake? What? I have to read this thing. It's a pattern interrupt. You know AI didn't write that. AI writes what's obvious because most people are obvious communicators with not pattern interrupt, but with patterns. And AI tends to create patterns. So what I like to do as a as a writer is it's a communicator is connect things that are not at all connected. It seems and make these can make these things tie in one with uh, another. Like even the concept of the offer of the monthly advanced business persuasion case studies. Has anyone ever heard of it, if monthly advanced business persuasion case studies that you can test every month with your marketing communications? That's not a thing. And yet now it is. AI would not have come up with that unless you knew exactly what the prompt would say. <laughs> and yeah, monthly business persuasion. Okay, there, you know, they would come up, they would come up with that. But so good they call you a fake. Uh, what? And it's the concept of, of this book right here I mentioned from Dr. Philip Ovedia, the cardiologist. It's not... A heart surgeon's guide to health and wellness, which is what an AI might have said. And that's good enough in most contexts. But the title is Stay Off My Operating Table. It might have taken some prompting to get an AI there, but you have to know prompt engineering. And so now prompt engineering and editing become essential skills for a ghostwriter. Wink, wink. Anyway, that one, that one tip right there of the pattern interrupt, the unexpected, the tying seemingly disparate ideas one to another together as part of the message and even laying the context is powerful. It also differentiates your communication from anything that's AI written, which is sounding like everyone else. And this day and age where attention is influenced, we need attention more than anything else. Frankly, bar none right now, by far, the best way to do that is with these pattern interrupts and tying together the unexpected to introduce your message. Wow, this is so intense, Joshua. Like, uh, I, I love it. And uh, I learned something new today uh, from you, Joshua, honestly. Uh, and this is, you know, I hope that the audience will, will I'm sure that they're going to benefit from it, especially the last part, you know, about the pattern interruption. This is something amazing. Well, Joshua, like, I, I wish, you know, we, we could do more and more. And I think we should do another episode, actually. Uh, I'm sure about it, just to to go deep dive in, in, in these methodologies and, you know, these concepts that you mentioned, 
Um, um, but again, still with what we did today is it's a master class, and really I appreciate. You know, it was bit um, after midnight for you, and you showed up on the show uh, with me today. So really, I appreciate the time. I be, we make sure that all the links that you mentioned they are on the show notes. So guys, you can reach out to Joshua directly, uh, and also you know, like uh, if if uh, Anything you want to ask and, you know, you had difficulties reaching Joshua, you can send your questions to me. I will uh, forward them. And as usual, this is how we end the, the episodes. Like, you know, thank you very much for, for tuning in. Keep the feedbacks coming. Keep, you know, the even if they are negative ones, I love to read negative feedbacks because they keep me doing the right thing later on. And if you are also interested to be a guest on the show, don't be shy. Reach out and we arrange for it you need to have like an idea maybe you are a startup founder maybe you are up to a concept you know which is not very known but you believe the world should, should hear about it so don't hesitate to reach out this is a open space for all the ideas and as you will thank you very much for tuning in we'll see you again in the next episode bye bye hit that subscribe button Share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.